All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Cyril Zeller. I lead a group at Edmedia of um, software engineers um, that uh, called developer technology for GPU computing. And uh, what we do is uh, collaborate with application developers outside NVIDIA uh, to accelerate their application, uh, applications using the GPU. Um, and, um, and we also, of course, work, uh, co collaborate closely with uh, the, the architecture department at, N at NVIDIA and the uh, software department at NVIDIA on the next generation architectures to make sure that uh, the, our next generation uh, GPUs will meet the developers' needs uh, when we ship them uh, years down the road. So um, before I uh, give you a quick update on um, where NVIDIA is heading in high performance computing, I wanted to quickly recap uh, where we are today and what that means for applications. This will be mostly uh, known by everyone here. Um, as single thread performance per watt dramatically slowed down a few years ago uh, as we uh, could no longer uh, scale down uh, uh, voltage and scale up frequency as we were scaling uh, down transistor size. And so um, the only way forward for, uh, to uh, significantly uh, more performance per watt is to go parallel uh, with massive multi-threading. And performance per watt, as we all know and has been uh, uh, talked about in, uh, um, in this um, event, is really the, the metric to improve on, uh, given the growing power constraints and requirements that all processors have from uh, mobile devices to supercomputers. So uh, processors are getting wider, not faster. And, um, and today, uh, all processors share the same um, they, they, they share common architectural features, as illustrated in this slide. Uh, as, as, um, as I just described, they, they are all first built by replicating some, some core units uh, for, for NVIDIA. Uh, this core unit is a streaming multiprocessor, and there are 15 of them in the Kepler architecture. Uh, for Intel, uh, this uh, core unit is a core, eight in uh, the, um, the Xeon file, uh, sorry, Z Z regular Xeon and, and uh, uh, up to 60 or 61 in, uh, in um, uh, the Xeon file. And then uh, it's, it's called a module for AMD CPUs and a compute unit for AMD GPUs. This, this uh, core unit has a pipeline architecture for processors to increase instruction performance. And it has a SIMD architecture uh, to increase compute density. And the SIMD architecture uh, is exposed either to the programmers either explicitly as vectors uh, on CPUs or implicitly as warps or wavefronts, warps for NVIDIA, wavefronts for, uh, for AMD. Um, and in addition to that, uh, this uh, core unit also can issue multiple instructions to exploit um, instruction level Python. Anyway, so my point here is that um, um, the the requirements for applications to achieve good performance on all uh, processors are fundamentally the same for, uh, for all processors, right? Uh, first, applications have to uh, need to expose a high level uh, of parallelism, uh, and they have to do that on two levels. Uh, first, they have to have enough instruction, independent instructions executed in parallel um, via uh, thread level parallelism and instruction level parallelism and so that they can utilize all those streaming multiprocessors or cores within the, uh, within the processor and so that they can saturate instruction pipelines. But they also have to expose enough independent memory accesses um, uh, performed uh, uh, in parallel uh, in order to keep uh, enough bytes in flight to saturate DRAM bandwidth as well. And then the other requirements are that an application need to expose data locality and data and execution locality to take advantage of this SIMD architecture that we find on all those processors. So exposing data locality means that um, memory accesses within a vector or within a warp um, need, must be coalesced or as much as possible um, uh, so that um, uh, so in order to minimize the number of cache lines uh, requested by the, the vector or the warp uh, and uh, maximize the bytes used from, from each cache line. Exposing execution locality means that uh, the uh, application must eliminate or at least minimize um, um, divergent ex execution path within a vector or a warp. Uh, 
Uh, otherwise, execution cycles uh, are wasted uh, because all uh, divergent paths within a, a vector or a warp are executed for all uh, vector components or threads in the warp. Processes differ in uh, the level of uh, parallelism they, they require um, and um, to saturate instruction pipelines and DRM bandwidth and also in the level of performance per watt they can achieve. GPUs um, require higher, uh, a higher level of parallelism than CPUs. Uh, they also generally uh, achieve a higher performance per watt at those higher levels of parallelism. Uh, here I have two slides now that just illustrate that. Uh, it's just a sample of uh, some uh, applications that uh, have been accelerating using GPUs today. Uh, this slide is about single node performance comparing uh, NVIDIA K20X with a, uh, an, an Intel Sandy Bridge, dual socket Sandy Bridge. So, um, uh, so here you have a, a bunch of uh, scientific apl applications that are leading applications in their respective fields. Uh, and, in, and here you have two mini applications that are used for exascale co-design and, and here are the results you get. Uh, this slide is about multi-node performance. Those are preliminary early results on um, um, uh, um, Titan and Blue Waters and Monte Rosa system that have that are Cray systems. Uh, with um, um, so Titan ha uh, is uh, has XK seven nodes, which is one NVIDIA K20X and an AMD Opteron, uh, and uh, um, uh, Monte Rosa and. Um, uh, and the part of Blue Waters uh, uh, have uh, XE6 node, which are two AMD opterns. And so here we're comparing um, um, a run on uh, a certain number of nodes, uh, and uh, where all the nodes are XK7 versus all the nodes are XE6. Um, and here are the, the results you get for a range of applications that are also uh, important scientific applications. So as Moore's law keeps going, um, the rate at which the number of transistor, uh, transistors in the processor grows means that uh, throughputs uh, uh, increase at a faster pace than latencies. And therefore, by Little's law, that means that the trend is towards even higher level of parallelism. So targeting today's GPUs, uh, which already have a high level of parallelism, in fact, prepares you for, the, for, the, for future processes, be they CPUs or GPUs. And uh, as um, uh, Brunson mentioned yesterday, uh, uh, and Steve also just before me, uh, we, we observe that um, in, uh, regarding uh, regular CPU, we observe that um, making the necessary adjustments to get uh, good performance on GPUs on today's applications often leads to uh, higher performance on CPUs as well, on today's CPUs. Uh, today's CPUs uh, are often underutilized by those applications. So although most of the work of an application must be done by those highly parallel uh, cores optimized for uh, performance per watt, uh, you will often need also um, a few cores that are optimized for single thread performance in order to execute the um, hopefully small remaining fraction of the code that is still serial. Um, and that's why uh, the future is uh, hybrid uh, systems. So an application that fits all the requirements I, I just described is uh, real-time 3D render, uh, graphics rendering, uh, for which millions of triangles and pixels are processed in parallel in order to generate an image in less than a thirtieth of a second. And GPUs uh, are the result of many years of research and development figuring out how to um, excel at those type of massively uh, parallel workload. And so it's no coincidence that uh, GPUs also excel at other highly parallel applications. So the GPU, which is currently based on the Kepler architecture, uh, is at the core of most of NVIDIA's multiprocessors and appliances. And we have uh, multiple families of processors uh, targeting different needs. The GeForce family is designed for consumer graphics, Quadro for professional graphics, Tegra for mobile computing, Tesla for high performance computing, and Grid for cloud computing. Uh, 
And so what that means is that NVIDIA's investment in uh, high performance computing, um, as well as NVIDIA's investment in mobile computing via Tegra, the, uh, uh, the, the advent NVIDIA's investment in uh, um, high performance computing via Tesla is really just an incremental investment on top of a much larger core investment that we make every year and have been making for the past 20 years and that we are lever leveraging across all, the, all those markets. So in the future uh, for high performance computing, NVIDIA is uh, investing in uh, three areas. Enable more developers, more performance powered, and future computing platforms. And I will uh, quickly uh, go over those in uh, the uh, time that um, I have. All right, so, um, so GPU computing has a lot of momentum as illustrated in this uh, slide that compares 2008 statistics with uh, 2013 uh, statistics. But the developer toolkit, uh, CUDA toolkit, um, is downloaded uh, every minute. Uh, the, number of the, to the number of GPUs uh, around the world, the number of GPU uh, developers around the world is increasing every day. And, and we have now more than 600 uh, universities teaching GPU computing around the world. But we can do better. And recently, for example, we partnered with uh, Udacity and Coursera to schedule massively online, uh, massively um, open uh, online courses uh, on, on GPU computing to extend uh, the way we teach GPU computing. And those have been very successful. Um, we're also continuing to um, uh, roll out more useful and smarter developer tools. Uh, for example, uh, our profiler uh, will now uh, automatically guide you through uh, discovering uh, performance bottlenecks in your application, uh, making it easier for you to target your optimizations, and we'll keep doing that. So a powerful way to enable more developers is just to speak their language. And CUDA C was actually born uh, from that premise. Uh, before CUDA C, developers um, who uh, wanted to leverage uh, GPUs uh, to solve non-graphics problems uh, had to learn an API and often tediously map their non-graphics problems to uh, graphics paradigms. Um, so we made the necessary changes in our ha uh, hardware um, uh, and in our software stack so that they could uh, instead use the same, uh, use the programming languages they were familiar with, C and Fortran. So we're co continuing in that vein. Uh, a few years ago, we adopted the LLVM framework, uh, which is an open source framework to um, build um, compiler tools and tool chains. Um, and today, we offer the necessary tools uh, for uh, the developer community to use LLVM to add GPU support to um, any languages. Uh, Python, Java, R, uh, domain-specific languages. Um, um, yeah, and, and the developers can also use LLVM to target other processors than GPUs. Some developers uh, favor approaches that are based on uh, compiler directives. And f uh, for that reason, we partner uh, with a bunch of companies to create OpenACC. OpenACC is a uh, is a set of compiler directives, very similar to OpenMP compiler directives, that target uh, GPUs. And as more and more developers uh, um, are using OpenACC, we are actively working on improving and extending uh, the OpenACC specifications, uh, uh, in part based on uh, the feedback we get from the field from those developers using uh, OpenACC today. At one point in time, we expect accelerators like GPUs to uh, become part of the OpenMP standard, and we intend to be part of that. We are also going to improve our hardware to make it easier for uh, developers to learn parallel programming using GPUs, um, uh, and also to make it easier uh, to port uh, a legacy code to the GPU. And one. Uh, a uh, key feature that um, will help with this is UVM, which, which stands for Unified um, Virtual Memory, and that we, we will natively support in our um, uh, upcoming Maxwell uh, architecture. And uh, there will also be a software prototype that supports UVM on, on the Kepler architecture, uh, and that will uh, come in an in a, um, upcoming CUDA release. Uh, UVM 
essentially allows the CPU and the GPU uh, to directly access each other's memory, uh, making it, um, eliminating the need for applications to uh, explicitly transfer data uh, from, um, uh, from one memory to another, uh, to the other. Uh, and um, essentially, uh, uh, you, you, you don't need transforming the, the, the program on the left uh, to the uh, program on the right, where you don't need all the uh, co uh, CUDA mem copy and, and CUDA malloc. And essentially making uh, memory management and optimization as opposed to a requirement as it is today. So relentlessly pushing for more performance power is the first of our business. So of course you can expect that future GPUs will push the envelope in terms of gigaflops per watt. Um, but uh, more performance per watt also means a more memory bandwidth per watt. That's, it's necessary in order to maintain a ratio of instruction throughput over uh, memory bandwidth that is in line with what uh, most applications uh, need. One way to do that, to increase memory bandwidth per board, is to add more GPUs uh, on the board. And uh, we, we're starting doing that with our K10 product, and we will likely keep doing that in the future. But we also want to, um, um, in, uh, in our future Volta architecture, we want to use stacked, stacked DRAM, uh, which will um, boost um, memory bandwidth even further. And finally, we are aligned with uh, the main uh, directions in HPC. One of them is ARM. And uh, our partner, Seco, will uh, um, release the Kayla development plat platform, which is a, a board with a, a quad ARM a processor and, and a standard PCI Express bus that can support any NVIDIA GPU. And, and we're finding that uh, porting applications to, to ARM uh, is, is, very, is pretty simple for uh, Linux applications. Um, uh, NAMD, which is uh, an important molecular dynamic code, uh, took only two days uh, to port on this, on this uh, platform. Uh, and our own uh, optics ray tracer took only a day. And finally, of course, Exascale is, a, is, is an important direction. And, uh, and we have a vision for it. Uh, we, um, and we are actively working with uh, several co-design centers towards this vision. Uh, here is a diagram that uh, represents what, uh, what we think uh, an exascale system will look like, uh, and, and then the key architectural features that it, it will have. Um, I don't plan to review all those in detail. I don't have time. But um, you, you can notice that um, uh, there is a, 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 a node in this system is a mix of, well, if you can see actually, uh, is, a, is a mix of um, throughput uh, optimized cores, TOC, that we call TOC, and latency optimized cores uh, that we call uh, LOC, which, which uh, is, is exactly what I was referring to uh, earlier, that uh, such a system needs to be a hybrid system. I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank